Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session with Dr. Tam Cummings. And this is going to be another one of our sessions of Ask Dr. Tam. So we hope that you get a lot of information from the session today. And our session today is sponsored by Vitas Healthcare and we have Candace Ramos with us today. She's going to tell you a little bit about Vitas. So Candace, go ahead. Thank you. Hospice care at the optimal time gives patients the gift of time. They can come to terms with their diagnosis, spend time reminiscing, saying goodbyes, get the affairs in order, and focus on quality of life at the end of life. Optimally timed hospice care also relieves healthcare professionals, caregivers, and families of the crises, stress, and challenges of increasingly challenging symptoms and situation as a patient declines. There are a couple of questions you can ask yourself if maybe it's the right time for hospice. So number one, is your loved one facing one of these life-limiting diseases or conditions? Cancer, cardiac and circulatory diseases, dementia, Alzheimer's, respiratory disease, or stroke? Is the patient or loved one showing these signs of decline? Curative treatments are no longer working. The patient has said, I don't want to go to the hospital anymore. Are they losing weight? Are they going to the hospital more? Are they having difficulties with their activities of daily living? And last but not least, have you taken the patient's wishes into consideration? Are you aware of what the patient's wishes are when it comes to end-of-life care um, and what they would want in the event that they were need to be hospitalized or receive ex um, extensive medical treatments that were life prolonging? If you have any questions or you answered yes to any of these questions, uh, we would love for you to give us a call or visit our website at www.vitas.com or call 1-800-93-VITAS, V-I-T-A-S. Thank you and hope you enjoy the call today. Thank you, Candace, and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, before uh, Tam gets started, let me tell you just a little bit about her if you have not met her before. Dr. Tam Cummings founded her company in 2009 with the mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. Welcome, Tam. Hi, Glenda. Hi, everybody. Thank you, VTOS, and God bless all our hospice people. One of my friends that was here this weekend is a retired RN who's now a hospice volunteer, mm. and you really do want them in place the final year, not the final week or the final day. Um, they, they bring an extra layer of professional care, an extra, extra professional eyes to look at your loved one. They have people that are specifically there to help you, the caregiver, so Please don't be afraid of hospice. Hospice doesn't mean somebody's going somewhere tomorrow. Hopefully it just means we're getting that next layer of care in. So please, please talk about hospice and what your own needs would be. Because it's harder to have these conversations when no one's had them before. So Glenda, yes. on that happy, yay. Um, the weather has finally broken Texas. We've, we've um, that's why Candace was outside while ago uh wow. and it's just it, it's in the 90s but to us here who's who've been just melting this feels like springtime weather outside it's just lovely um so i'm not sure what we want to talk about today if we want to start with uh no, we'll start with our questions that we got okay Let's fire away that, and that'll probably generate more um questions from our participants so this is um a message that we got from Cliff, and I saw Cliff, he's on the phone. There he is right there. So let me read this to you, and I'll go question by question. So we'll go from there. Um, Dr. Tam, thank you for all of your help in the world of dementia. I have attended the last few sessions and listened to many before that. Wish I had been aware of your work several years ago. Knowing your thoughts and suggestions would have impacted my caregiving efforts with my wife. My questions for this session are as follows. Number one, what do you say to a family member who was not the primary caregiver to help them address their grief after having to agree to put their family member in a care facility? I, I think that, first of all, it's such a great question. And 
so brilliant to recognize that the people around that loved one are grieving, but I, I think it's going to be just you having a conversation with them and bringing the topic up that it is normal to be at post-death grief. It is normal to be grieving for this person as though they'd already passed because the, the person that you knew is gone. Um, families tell you over and over again, that's not my mother anymore. It looks like her. Sometimes it sounds like her, but that's not her or that's not my husband anymore. And, and it stopped being my husband years and years ago. And in, in our country, as part of our culture, talking about grief and talking about death is not part of our culture. We, we don't like to say people died. We don't, we, we say they, they passed or they went somewhere. So it, it's, a, it's a very difficult conversation to have, but ultimately a very powerful and, and very positive one, because you're, you're saying to that family member, I'm grieving and I, I know you must be grieving too. And I'm here if you need to grieve with me or if you need to talk. Um, you can get wonderful ideas off the website grief.com. That is David Kessler's website. And he was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's graduate student and is the co-author of the, the stages of grief that we all think about. And so remember that when you do talk to someone about grief, you may be dealing with someone who's who literally is in denial. Now, a lot of times I say, I don't think that person's in denial. I think they're not educated. But part of the grieving process is with each loss you have in your loved one that you see and notice, there is another set of grief that starts. And that thing starts again. And it starts with denial of, oh, no. And then it may make you angry because nobody told you this was going to happen. And then you may feel guilty because you found out that you, when they were repeating everything, it actually indicated brain damage and they weren't doing it on purpose. And so with each bit of decline, Glenda, we see grief start anew in little, to me, it's like a thousand million tiny pricks that happen to the caregiver's soul and to the people around that are all part of this same family. And to be brave enough to go up and discuss their grief, to ask if they're grieving, to ask if there's something you can do to help is such a powerful, powerful thing. And at the same time, you have to remember everybody grieves differently. Everybody, be, everybody grieves at their own pace. Some people may appear not to be grieving and it just may be that you don't recognize what grief is. Grief, Glenda, can be that my spouse walked by and asked for a cup of coffee and I snapped and was, was there. It wasn't a cup of coffee. That can be grief. And grief can affect us. It certainly affects us physically. It releases uh, neurotransmitters in our brain that happen when we grieve. Those things make it hard for us to think clearly. If the person who died had dementia, now we begin to think, oh, I've got it too. And it, it's really the grieving process. And another part of grief that your family member may not be aware of is when we grieve, it, it easily causes our body to hurt and to have aches and pains in places that you may have even gone to see your physician about and they can't explain it. They can't figure out what's going on. It's because you're actually experiencing the physical side of, of grief. Um, we even now have a broken heart syndrome uh, that's recognized that people do die of a broken heart. There's a actual Latin name for it and it's, and it's recognized, but having that conversation is very brave. You may be the first person to have brought up grief. I think we're not very good at realizing how hard and how much families are grieving and to help a family member measure their grief and realize that it is real. Um, at the bottom on the tools section of my website, you can get the, mm caregiver grief inventory you can google and it's mm like the candy not m and m but mm mickey mouse mm caregiver grief inventory and that allows you to have a conversation have a tool that you can actually help them use and remember grief also affects us with anxiety. Anxiety is grieving, what if, what if, what if, and depression is grieving, coulda, woulda, shoulda. 
And the tools for those are the um, geriatric depression scale. Even if you're a younger person, that, that validity rating is 98%. So it's very good. And then we also have the Hamilton Anxiety Scale, the Generalized Anxiety Disorder Scale, and you can get those on my website or you can Google them. They're in the domains for people to use. And they're there to help you understand not only that what you're feeling is real, you, you really are having anxiety, you really are having grief, you, you truly are having depression, but it then allows you to take those tools and go have a better conversation with your physician or in the case of Cliff, be able to take those tools and share them with the family member. Um, and remember, family members who have not been primary caregivers may be grieving additional guilt because they, for whatever reason, were not a primary caregiver. Does, does that make sense, Clinda? Yes, absolutely. So we can, we can have grief because I lived in New York and my sick person was in Texas and I wasn't able to get here, you know, and you don't really expect me to use my vacation up like that, do you? Mm -hmm. So you can have grief and guilt mixed together. You can have anger and grief mixed together. So all of those things that, that um, you'll find on grief.com or on Kubler Ross's stages of grief, those all allow you to have a conversation. It also allows you to uh, check your own self. It helps you validate for someone that they are suffering great sorrow right now and, and that it's okay. And then the next thing to do for that person is to go to self-compassion.org so it's self-compassion.org. That's Dr. Kristen Neff's website. And if you scroll down there, Glenda, she has a test on there to take. And, you know, I'm, I'm competitive. Mm -hmm. And um, so I took the test thinking for sure I'd score a five. And I, I think I scored a 1.2, which means I'm very, very kind to others, but not to myself. And part of that grieving process, part of, all of the concepts of grieving come back around to as you're helping that family friend or that family member, what are you doing to help yourself? And so self-compassion.org lets you go online, take a quick 10 minute test, and it very quickly calculates whether or not you're being as kind to yourself as you are to other people. And that then helps you process, to me, I think it helps to process some of the grief and, and guilt that, that you might feel. That makes sense, Glenda? It does, but we're all works in progress, you know, and so being kind to ourselves is kind of in that vein. So let's it's, look it's at Cliff's second hard to do. Yeah, It is hard to okay. do. Because we can be so kind to just our puppy and everybody else in the world, but mm, yeah. So our second question. But here's the thing while you mentioned puppies. Oh, yeah. Is if you if you pet your pet, like a furry pet, not a slithery pet, but <laughs> we know that petting your dog turns on your happy gene in your brain. It turns on happy things in your brain for about 45 minutes. That's amazing. So petting your dog, petting your cat, uh, very good for you. That's why we finally recognized why those are, it's so important that humans have their emotional support animal. And, and that little critter helps. It really, really does help the brain. Okay. Next question, Glenda. Fire no, no, no. Next question. Okay, Cliff. Thanks for submitting these for us, by the way. Uh, last month, you addressed the issue of aggression behavior and Alzheimer's. This has been very helpful. My question now is, what are your thoughts on which drug or drugs should or could be used to help reduce this, especially for one who is prone to falling on a regular basis and will not use a walker or a wheelchair? Okay, so first of all, you have to realize it's not that they won't use a walker or a wheelchair. That, that's you witnessing brain damage. Walkers weren't invented until 1974. So it tells me that your person is before 1974. And I don't know about you, Glenda, but <clears throat> I never saw a wheelchair growing up. 
Uh, we didn't have a kid in school in a wheelchair. Oh. Wheelchairs were not normal. They, you had to be rich to have a wheelchair because that generation of the Great Depression. And so <clears throat> it's not that your person's refusing to do something or doesn't want to do something. It's brain damage. And the fact that they're having falls is brain damage. And it tells you, um, all of these things tell you that several different areas of that person's brain are either damaged to the point that they no longer exist or they're so heavily damaged. And that's why this person can't hold themselves in um, balance and can't ambulate correctly. They can't move their body correctly. And it's not just the walking, Glenda, when you pay attention, it's if I'm having trouble walking and I'm having off and a lot of falls, then I'm also having trouble grasping something and bringing it to my mouth. I'm having trouble getting food to come into my mouth using a spoon or a fork. I'm having beginning to have trouble to remember that I chew the food and then I swallow the food. So those falls are all indicative that there is significant brain damage going on. And it's again, not that a person is refusing to learn how to use a walker, it's that they don't understand what it's for anymore. And it's no different than if you were trying to get an infant to pull itself up and use a walker. An infant doesn't have the body brain capability to do that because their brain hasn't developed enough. Their body hadn't developed enough. Your loved one can't do it and is having falls because their brain is damaged enough that that ability to do that doesn't exist anymore. Now, as, as far as pain, I'm not a geriatrician, I'm a gerontologist, I'm a research scientist. A geriatrician is who you would talk to about medications. But the first thing that we would do for the geriatrician, for the neurologist, for the primary care physician is 50% of the aggressive behaviors in people with dementia are untreated chronic pain. And yes, we have ageism in our medical professionals. Oh, yeah. We have medical professionals who look at older people and go, well, you're, you're in your 80s. What do you want me to do? Well, I want you to fix my pain. We have medical professionals who go, well, she has dementia. She doesn't feel pain. That's not true. The behaviors tell you that person has pain and you, the family member, know their pain history better than anyone else. And Glenda, you have to balance that with a generation of people that were taught to not talk about pain, not complain about pain. We don't have anything for you. And if you were male from the time you were a, a toddler, when a little boy falls down, no one picks him up. That's part of our society. When a little girl falls down, we all run to pick her up and dust her off, tell her to be okay. To the little boy, we say, suck it up, be a boy, be a big boy, be a man. And we, they, they get that message early. So we are dealing with still three generations of people who were taught <clears throat> not to ever say they were in pain, but we know right off the bat, 50% of their behavior is untreated chronic pain. And Glenda, I'm not talking about they get a Tylenol a day. These folks have osteoarthritis. I have osteoarthritis. I get a Celebrex every night, which is a prescription level painkiller for osteoarthritis. And before I got on this call, I've already taken two Motrin this morning, which is eight a leave. And all of that is to address the normal pain that I feel every day. And I'm not talking about there's a storm coming and I'm feeling more pain. So for that reason, because we know we can't trust somebody with brain damage to recognize or tell us they have pain, we instead use the, the tool called pain ad. It's all capital letters. It, you can Google it or it's on the website, but it stands for pain assessment in advanced dementia. It's called pain ad, P-A-I-N-A-D. And those of you who are parents, when you look at it, you'll go, oh, well, this is what I did when I had an infant. Exactly. Because now we're dealing with somebody who has massive brain damage. So you're looking at how they're breathing, how they're vocalizing. Can they be consoled? Can they be redirected? Is their body tense? Are they grimacing? Are they grinding their teeth? And you go through and give them a, a you score in the boxes, either a one or a two, and you add those up. And Glenda, even a score of one means mild pain. I don't mm. want any pain. And I know every single person on this phone call, on this Zoom, I know that every single one of you at some point in time has been asked by a doctor, what's your level of pain on a scale of one to 10? 
and you had a bone sticking out of your leg and you went, oh, like a four. Yeah, yeah. not bad. You know, and women, you've given birth and, you know, pain. So we know that there is pain. And the first thing you want to do, Cliff, is you want to address the person's pain. And we use the pain ad for that. Then if we're still having behavior, you have to remember that 20% of the behaviors is that you and I approached the person incorrectly and we didn't respect that as the disease progresses by stage five, these folks don't see things the way you and I do. It can be right in front of them and they don't see it. But if you yell at them and they were naturally a fighter, you might get smacked if you walk up too quickly and I don't see you because I no longer see things the way you see. I only see this little periscope right in front of me. And if you suddenly appear in front of me, my startle reflex may make me hit you. So the next thing that we look at is what was the caregiver doing? What did I do when I approached this person that caused this aggressive behavior? Then I look at, are they getting caffeine? Because Caffeine, we don't give people with dementia because it's a natural diuretic and they're already having UTIs. So we don't need to give them something else that makes their body lose fluid. And what was it, caffeine? And we're not paying attention to the noise around them. We're not paying attention to some new medicine they might have. We're not paying attention to there's too much light, there's too much dark, it's too hot, it's too cold. People with dementia react to the environment around them. We're the ones with the three pound brain. So you got to figure out the environment. Then you have to look at what exactly is the behavior? Does it occur at the same time every day? Because if it does, then the doctor needs to know because we've got some sort of medication issue. And you have to draw out for your doctor what it is exactly that you're witnessing. Now, Glenda, the most common thing I'm told is some little old ladies beating the hell out of everybody all day long. And I know that that's not true because nobody's doing anything all day long except breathing. And if she was actually that violent, she'd be in a Jerry psych unit as they were trying to figure out what was going on with her. So you have to narrow down the behavior for the doctor. So first I'm going to do the pain ad. I'm going to pay attention to how I've been approaching. If I'm still seeing the behavior, I'm going to do the geriatric depression scale or the Cornell scale for depression in people with dementia. So the Cornell scale, and then that should be on my website as well, but it's the Cornell scale for depression in dementia. I'm going to use the Hamilton anxiety scale. And then if the behavior is still there and it's a very aggressive, very hostile behavior that I'm witnessing, <clears throat> my next thought is going to be that I'm looking, is there a vascular dementia because they tend to be more aggressive and more agitated. But then I'm going to finally, Glenda, look at the brief psychiatric rating scale. And the brief psychiatric rating scale is what your doctor's going through in their mind when they're thinking about this person needs antipsychotic drugs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Cornell scale for depression and dementia lets you look at your person and grade them as to whether you're seeing depression. The brief psychiatric rating scale lets you look at your person and have a talk with your doctor about antipsychotics. And Glenda, not every antipsychotic has to be Seroquel at 450 milligrams. We have antipsychotic medicine that's 0.25 milligrams. So things that start very low and very slow is what you're looking at. But that brief psychiatric rating scale lets you have a better conversation, conversation with your physician then yeah, their behavior is out of control because that, do, that doesn't give the doctor any information to, to act on. Now, if the person is Parkinson's or Lewy body, they have a special non-typical antipsychotic called Nuplazid and it's N-U-P-L-A-Z-I-D. And that is used, Nuplazid is used to treat their hallucinations. But Basically, Cliff, you have to back up and look at first pain, second is me, the caregiver, third is uh, depression, anxiety, or am I actually seeing a, psych a psychotic issue here that needs uh, addressing? And we're very careful. Um, your physician is going to be very careful um, about antipsychotic usage because it's deadly to people with dementia. But you and your physician have to make a decision. Do you want your person 
like this the final few years of their life? Or do you want some medication where they can be more like their old self and not agitated and out of control because of a brain disease? No. So it's a lot of stuff. When we start looking at behaviors, Glenda, it's a lot, a lot of things. You have to look at what stage is the person in, what type of dementia or dementias do they have? Because all of those things impact the behavior of the person because those things tell us the order in which the brain is being destroyed and certain behaviors, certain things you and I do exist in certain lobes. So a lot of emotion and aggression is right up here in the frontal lobes and the frontal lobes are heavily damaged in all of the dementias. Uh, one thing that came to mind when you were talking about no caffeine, you didn't talk about alcohol and dementia. Yeah, I just assumed we're not drinking, <laughs> but yeah, they, they cannot no, have no. alcohol. <laughs> alcohol causes a, um, causes a, a, a dementia all by itself. And alcohol's technical name is neurotoxin and neurotoxin means brain poisons. So um, people with dementia cannot be having alcohol. Although <clears throat> the last two or three people whose houses I've gone into, one of them was um, actually rolling a joint in front of me while she finished off her beer. She's yeah. in her late 50s. And um, the other one, uh, and, and both of these folks that, in this case, both people were retired pastors and they had both started drinking brandy and their kids had no idea what was going on. They just knew that suddenly both of their parents had, both dads had changed. So I have recently run into uh, older people who have spent a lifetime not drinking and are now drinking very, very sweet alcohols oh. uh, because of the craving for sugar. And then because of COVID, People weren't around them. Their families weren't around them the way they are now. And so the drinking very quickly took over their lives. And now we've got people that are drinking significant amounts. And by significant, Glenda, a bottle a day, a bottle and a half a day of brandy, bottle and a half a day of Mogan David wine. So yeah, no drinking. And if, if, if they like the taste of beer, if they like the taste of wine, there are so many non-alcoholic, wines and beers now there's like 20 different beers you can get bock beer dark beer different types of beers oh. um and they do taste very much like beer and the person with dementia will even begin to act drunk when they drink these things so you can switch stuff out they're going to complain that this that this wine isn't quite right but um they've gotten much better on the wines they've gotten incredibly good on the beers so mm. you use those well, I'm glad I asked that question. I mean, I knew the answer, but I wanted you to explain it. Um, so let's cl get to Cliff. Hang on. I, I got to, can you hold my beer for a second? I can't tell you how many times I heard that this weekend because it was just a joke. Hold my beer. It's a hold my beer moment. So oh. yeah, just, you've got to get it away from them by, by hook or by crook because it's damaging them even more. Right, right. So we want to get to Cliff's last question then we're going to open it up for other questions. Um, Cliff says, my last question is more research oriented. Should doctors be prescribing the MOCA, MOCA or SLUMS test, especially for those who have a hard time answering all of the five or six questions often given by general practitioners? I've done those myself, Cliff. So far, I've passed. <laughs> Cliff, what you're talking about is called the mini mental status exam. It was designed by Folstein and Folstein in the early 70s, and it's an orientation exam. It was intended that, um, oh, I fell down, I hit my head. You took me to the emergency room. The doctor is very quickly giving me a series of, of questions to see if I'm alert and oriented to time, date, place. Do I understand where I am? And if I can't answer those questions and I should be able to, then I need a CAT scan immediately because something horrible is happening in my brain. And people with dementia can on average pass the MMSE five years before they finally fail it, even though it was never intended to be a cognition test. But the insurance companies have insisted that this is the test they will accept 
and it's to avoid paying out policies early. And, and the detriment of it is people end up in our country not being diagnosed until stage five of the disease. And by stage five, it is too late to start those medications. And so what the doctors should be using is the SLUMS test, which stands for St. Louis University Mental Status Exam. And I believe that's on my website too, Glenda. You can also Google yeah, the so. SLUMS test. It's all capital letters, S-L-U-M-S, but that's what it stands for. And in about 15 minutes, it allows, you can give it to your loved one, a nurse, a social worker, the doctor can give it to your loved one. But in about 15 minutes, it allows the physician to um, understand visual spatial damage in your loved one, long-term and short-term memory damage in your loved one, and um, several other things that it's me measuring. And it differentiates, Glenda, between normal aging, stage two, or mild cognitive impairment, or actual dementia. And it's extremely sensitive. The validity rating on it and the MOCA are both about 98 to 99%. They're very accurate tests. The MOCA test, you're normally going to see that being given by a neurologist who specializes in dementia, but it's considered about the same as the SLUMS test. It's just the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test is what MOCA stands for. But those are the tests that should be used. And I know I'm shocked insurance companies wouldn't want us to use those. So I'm sure everyone else is shocked as well. But what it stops us from, from doing is getting people on medicine when they're early in the disease. Mm. And so last week I was in deep East Texas area agency on aging, doing the tour, Glenda, you'd have been proud. Yep, yep. And a man came to the conference in the city that we were in. And he said, um, so yeah, I went to my doctor and I said, I think I'm having cognition problem. I, I feel like I'm not getting stuff correctly. I, I, it feels like it's not like I'm, I'm not doing stuff right. And the doctor said, oh, you're fine. And what the doctor should have done was say, here is your referral to UT Medical in Houston to this center. Let's get them called and get you scheduled to go over there for testing. If the guy had said to his physician, my big toe hurts, the physician would have said, here's the podiatrist. And if the guy had said to that same physician, I got a spot here on my face, he would have said, oh, let's send you to a dermatologist. If that man had said, my heart feels funny, I can feel it racing and beating, he would have said, oh my gosh, let's check in, get you into ER and get you to the uh, cardiologist right away. But the minute you said, I think my thinking's off, suddenly the doctor was an expert in dementia and said, oh, it's not a big deal. It's nothing to worry about. And yet it is. It is not normal to feel that something's not working in your brain correctly. So you go to a testing center and we've got them um, in different states. And then we also have the Texas best practices model, which we send out to families to say, here are the tests that they should be doing. It allows you to go into the doctor prepared to say, which one of these tests have been done and when will the rest of them be completed? Because there actually is a process to make a dementia diagnosis. Yep. Did that make sense? Did I finish the question? What was the question again? Oh, you did finish oh, so, the question. You did yeah, finish the so, question. Cliff, thank you for, for sending those in. And if any of you have questions before our next session, you can do the same. Get with our customer service representative and you know she'll tell you how to do that. Um, okay, so we have covered Cliff's questions. Now it's open to you if you have questions about your caregiving situation, the person you're caring for, um, just anything related to any types of dementia, which we know now from being with Tam all these years, in my case, uh, there are so many types of dementia. So go right ahead. Um, let's see here. Christine, please. Hi. Um, so I had a question about my father. Um, it might be a little, uh, unusual, but, um, I'll just give you a little background. Um, my dad is 82 and has vascular dementia after having two strokes this year. Um, I believe he is stage, uh, four to five, uh, depending on kind of what day he's having. He has significant speech and, um, impairment. He has word salad, so hard to express himself, um, 
he um, is kind of prone to agitation. Um, and um, he's currently living in an adult family home that is wonderful. Um, but my question is, he was recently diagnosed with um, advanced decay in five of his teeth, um, three of which are in his front teeth. And a few of them might be saved, but they're really borderline. They would take multiple really complex, very long dental appointments that both the dentist and I agree he would not be able to tolerate. Um, and he no longer retains information. So explaining to him why he's there and what is happening wouldn't stick. Um, and he has difficulty following directions, becomes frustrated easily. Uh, and, you know, when he gets frustrated and impatient, he can start to uh, become pretty agitated and combative. Um, because of these factors, the dentist is recommending extracting all five teeth. And I'm really concerned about the impact of this on him, especially since, you know, their front teeth. And um, the dentist is more, has warned me that he could develop really painful abscesses at any time on any of the five teeth. And to be honest, this has been keeping me up at night because I'm um, extremely torn between putting him through the trauma of five extractions and him not understanding why his teeth are all of a sudden gone, especially in the front, um, or not doing anything and risking a painful um, abscess. And realistically, I mean, um, my dad has some significant blockages um, that have shown up on his most recent MRI. And I wonder, I you know, how much time he has left anyway, and do I want to put him through this kind of trauma, or is it more cruel to risk him having a really painful abscess? Hmm. And, um, okay, um, that's a great question, and it's not him having a painful abscess. It's actually the infection from his teeth traveling through the sinus cavity to the brain, So, okay. um, and he's also not in stage four. You're describing somebody that's late stage five, so you, you have to remember I'm harder at grading than you are because for me it's not emotional and for you it is your father also sounds like alzheimer's has been developed at this point as well given his age and that vascular dementia just didn't start overnight it did it, it, like you said you've already got things that are clogged so when we have people with uh, teeth that need to be removed what typically will happen is the primary care orders them something like a valium that makes them very relaxed then the dentist extracts it's not a big deal to have teeth extracted it, it's I, I think this is a lot like you said it's keeping you up at night and it's become a oh my gosh oh my gosh what if what if and what needs to happen is he needs to be scheduled the teeth need to be pulled he needs to be go ahead and do the cornell scale for depression on him cuz remember anybody with vascular dementia automatically gets depression if you've got heart oh, issues he you have depression definitely so, has depression definitely okay so part of what you're seeing in the agitation is that he's not on an antidepressant or he's not on the right antidepressant um, but the other thing is the teeth can be causing pain and that causes agitation. I cannot imagine how much that would hurt because even breathing in through his mouth talking would cause air to flow across those and that can cause pain. Certain things he's eating can cause pain. And I wouldn't worry about the teeth being gone from the front. Um, they'll change how they process his food. I've seen people with no teeth eat steak. So um They'll give him a soft diet while his uh, stitches are healing um, until the sutures come out, but they'll make him very comfortable that day. They'll get the decay out and you want to get that out because it's not the abscess. It's that all of this is connected. You have a, a sinus cavity back here that you're, that's why you can somebody tells you a joke while you're drinking milk and you suddenly snort milk through your nose. How did that happen? Well, it's because all of this is connected and the brain's right here. And while this part is coated in bone, this part underneath isn't. And so infection from uh, the mouth can easily move into infection in the brain. And it certainly is deadly to people with dementia. So 
Um, it may be that you and, and the dentist decide, you know what, we just need to go ahead and get all of his teeth out. And then we'll, we'll go from there. And he's not going to put in dentures. He's not going to remember to do dentures, but just talk to the dentist about, would it just be better to get rid of everything? Because this will be his last dental appointment. I, I guess part of what I worry about too is him looking in the mirror and he doesn't remember and, and being shocked and horrified yeah, that his we don't really look missing. in the mirror that way. Yeah, we don't really look in the mirror. Okay. Um, and they don't see the way you and I are. And and he may notice that, but with the amount of damage to where you're able to see that he's going backwards in time. He just may think his, he's lost his front teeth again. And that's a memory that we all had. We just don't think about it, right? Okay. Because at some point you had chompers in the back, but then you lost the front chompers. So all they'll do is they'll change how they process his food and um, make sure that he's got uh, pain medication. But normally once they pull out extractions, he should, oh, and they, I'm expecting that they will, the dentist should be prescribing an antibiotic before the surgery to start boosting his body's immune system because of the infection that he's got in his mouth. So the decay, the, the decay is telling you there's already infection in the mouth. It's just not an open wound like you're thinking, but it certainly can connect to the brain. So get the teeth out. And then you just, your biggest thing is it's hurting him. There's no way that's not hurting him. And you're going to take care of the hurt. I wouldn't worry about the the front teeth and, until something, he says something about it. And then I would redirect him. But I, I would get the damaged, diseased teeth out of his mouth because it's not healthy for him. And then you'll feel better. And tell him he can eat ice cream faster now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think she froze. Frozen. Christine, you're frozen, but thank you for that question. Um, Cynthia. Hello. Um, I had a question regarding my mother. She is 69 years old, was diagnosed five years ago with early onset Alzheimer's. I think we are now um, in stage six um, because she looks sick. She's looking sick. She has had significant weight loss um, that started since February. Um, you and need to get her hospice. You need to get the hospice order then if there's weight loss. Okay. And recently, um, last week, she actually eloped from the assisted living facility that provides day respite to us while I'm at work. Um, and she was missing for three hours since no. that elopement her ability to do things on her own has completely changed. She used to bathe and shower and dress herself on her own with just prompts. Um, mm -hmm. And now for the last week, I've been having to bathe her and dress her because she will just stand in the shower confused. Even if I put shampoo in her it's hand, had, she doesn't know what to it, do. It, it sounds like she's had um, some stroke activity because that, that's the only thing that causes a family to go you know, on this day, she was okay, but on this day, something happened. And the only thing that does that is stroke. And somebody who is so young with an early onset Alzheimer's diagnosis, you would expect to be having strokes at this point. And remember, most people don't live to be bed bound. Most people die of heart attack or stroke uh, in stage five or stage six. The younger a person is, the more aggressive it is. I think you need to go ahead and ask the doctor for a hospice order based on what you're saying and see if you can't get that level of care added to help you. And then also you need to call your area agency on aging. Just Google for wherever you are and see what they have available to help you with respite care. Um, I ran into one the other day that their, their funding allowed them to pay for your mother to be in dementia care for three weeks to give you respite. And she's obviously, she is not appropriate for an assisted living of, of any kind. Um, stage five people should be in memory care. Stage six people should be in memory care in a nursing home. Okay. So we, we've, just done, be, we've done ACOG before. They've provided 80 hours in the past. So I can reach out to them again and find out what their new grant is offering. Okay. Okay. And then I think it, it just sounds like your mother has taken a sudden turn. Something something significant has happened and changed. 
And, and so I would be alert to that, make your family alert to it, make the doctor alert to it. Cause remember the doctor only sees your mom for five minutes. So fill out, um, fill out your DBAT, fill out your, everything that you're seeing happen to her, get that on paper so you can go to the doctor and go through what, what is going on. And they're, in my experience, they're not going to do anything because there's nothing they can do. But if you can look and say, Christine, she's, she's different or Cynthia, she's different than she, she was last week. She's having strokes and she's getting closer to the end. We did see her primary care last week that she eloped just so they could test for a UTI and make sure she wasn't severely dehydrated. We followed up with them today. There was no UTI. Her dehydration wasn't to the point that she needed hospitalization. She's been hydrating since then. But what they did notice today was she had a significant low blood pressure and heart rate. And they're considering maybe the lenesoprol that she's on for her high blood pressure might not be needed anymore. I, you know, you got to be really careful with high blood pressure, low blood pressure medications. And those should be being administered by typically a cardiologist, not a primary care, because it's a specialty. And the other thing is she has a terminal illness. So what's going to make her most comfortable for the remainder of her life? And so for a lot of people, it's that we're not going to have any more doctor's visits because there's, you know, what, all they want to do is draw blood or poker. And there's, you have to really think about what is the best medical move now for my loved one. And the best medical move is going to be that she needs skilled care, which is a nursing home. And we know that she'll get better care there and she'll have more activities to do. She'll be around licensed professionals and it'll let you step back and take a deep breath. But she's, she's more advanced, I think, than you're, than you're realizing. Okay, we see her neurologist tomorrow, so I'll fill those out and take them in with me. Okay, and, and just say we saw a sudden change in her on this day. And uh, yeah, I thought the same thing. As soon as you said elopement, I thought, okay, does she have a UTI? Has she had a stroke? Did anybody check for dehydration? By the way, does everybody know how to check for dehydration? We put our thumb between their eyebrows. We press really hard. And when you remove the thumb, count to five, one, two, three, four, five. And if there was a white spot there, then this person's dehydrated. So in licensed buildings, what they're doing is your loved one's getting hydration at breakfast. At 10 o'clock, there's hydration. At noon, there's lunch and hydration. At two o'clock, there's a hydration cart. There's dinner at five. And then there's an additional hydration cart at seven. So they're monitoring fluid in people with dementia throughout the day. But remember, those UTIs happen because of brain damage. And that dehydration happens because of brain damage and then if you're anywhere down in the South where we are, uh, the heat is just deadly to, to our dementia people. Yes, that was my concern because she eloped, we're in San Antonio, Texas. So she eloped in the middle of this like 104. Oh my gosh. And was out in the sun for about three hours till we found her. Um, mm, so I didn't nice. know. It. I'm glad y'all found her. I'm glad y'all found her. That must have been so frightening. But she yeah. should be in a higher level of care. Okay. Okay. And then do you have the little Apple tag you can put in her purse, put on a thing, make her yes. a bracelet we with her? Purchased one, her shoe. We purchased one that same day and now it is attached to her clothing every single day. Have mm. the grandkids make her a bracelet. Look at your new bracelet. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You're, you're a, a good daughter. Giver. You are a good daughter. You Thank are you. indeed. Indeed. Thank you for telling us that story. Um, anyone else have a question um, for Dr. Tam? Karen, I was wondering if you had any specific questions that came to mind um, about Parkinson's. Um. No, thank you, Glenda, and thank you, Tam. Uh, no, I've been in the community for nine years, and I was a support group leader for five of them, and I'm still an assistant support group leader, but I do have a, a weird question. Um, 
if a person cannot have an MRI due to metal in their body, are there other scans that can be done to the brain? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. They do. Um, and it's on the Texas best practices model, but it's PET scan, CAT scan, EEG, EKG. It's a number of tests that are done, and it's not just the MRI. Okay. Um, as you work with support groups, new things that have been discovered are uh, the later in life a person develops Parkinson's, the more rapidly it becomes Parkinson's disease dementia. Parkinson's has now been pulled under the Lewy body umbrella and is seen as a variant of Lewy bodies. And so if a person is diagnosed with, uh, if they have movement issues first, then cognition, Parkinson's. If they have cognition issues first, then movement issues, Lewy body. If they have Lewy bodies, I'm watching for the onset of Parkinson's followed by the onset of Alzheimer's. If they have Parkinson's, I'm watching for the onset of Lewy bodies followed by the onset of Alzheimer's. But I'm also, if it started with Parkinson's, I'm watching for the onset of some of the FTD movement disorders. So I'm watching for FTD movement disorders to uh, attack to attack this person's brain as well. So one of the things that's really coming to the forefront from research is not somebody having one dementia, it's really how many different dementias does a person have? And the cluster that gets looked at very frequently is Lewy body Parkinson's Alzheimer cluster. Um, remember Lewy bodies is the fourth most common dementia. Parkinson's is the sixth most common dementia. And then any one of those could also have a vascular component. And so as you go through your nine most common dementias and you rule out what the person can't have, you begin to get a much better idea of what could be going on in their brain. And then I don't, I usually just talk about those nine dementias, Glenda, but we have to realize those of us who work in this population, if I've got a Vietnam vet who was exposed to Agent Orange, then I need to make sure the doctor is aware of toxic dementia as well. Where y'all are out in Pennsylvania, you can have toxic dementia caused by y'all steel mills, uh, chemicals, stuff that's around you. Farmers and ranchers are at a risk for toxic dementia. Um, alcohol and cigarette smoking are both considered forms of toxic dementias. But if we don't think back to this person that we know or remind this family to think back, they can miss what's causing a certain behavior because we didn't give the doctor that information or the doctor hadn't thought to add in toxic dementia. And remember, if you're dealing with a Vietnam vet, the Veterans Administration now admits that Agent Orange does cause a dementia. So it's an automatic 100% disability for that, for that person. Yeah, um, unfortunately, my region in Western Pennsylvania is the second highest hotspot for Parkinson's. Um, uh, TCE. TCE mm -hmm. is also very common in our, in our watershed and our water supply. Um, but I, I have sadly, wondered because of y'all's numbers, what is it in that area? And the only thing that comes to mind is the chemicals in the mine stuff that, yeah, that goes um, around. And sadly, it's sort of like down in Beaumont. Yeah. Sadly, uh, most of our members um, never make it to dementia because they will have a fall. So, and then they wind up in the emergency room, which doesn't know how to deal with Parkinson's and you could go on forever for about that. But um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, and I'll, we also have a lot of Parkinson isms here, the PSPs and the multiple system atrophies. But um, uh, my husband actually has the issue with metal in his body where he can never have an MRI and his paternal uncle died with Parkinson's. And it just kind mm -hmm. of, made me wonder all of a sudden well my husband had a cardiac event this year and that's how they found out you can never have an mri and i thought hmm how often is this happening to other people you know if they can't have an mri are there other tests or any other illnesses oh, yeah. that they can have and oh, yeah. are they as accurate you know will they get the best results on the tests and the best care so and and then for your husband you just said something that said vascular so, you know, you, I, I, Glenda, I can't tell you how many times an interview in a family, I'll go, have there, has there been a cardiovascular event? And they'll tell me, no, is there a pacemaker? No, is there a defibrillator? No. And about 20 minutes later, they'll go, well, you know, when she had that heart attack, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of that vascular thing where we were talking about. So, um, 
y'all are in, there's just something not right up there. So there's yeah. something in y'all soil or just the air, Yeah, you know, there's, yep. there's a consequence to all this stuff around us. Yep. Yep. Well, I had a couple where, um, in this area, we have Neville Island, which is known for a lot of chemical companies. And then, uh, there was the Donora zinc smog back in the whatever's 19, 19- 20s or 1930s and we had a couple a member couple husband and wife who both were diagnosed with parkinson's and he had been raised on neville island and she had been in the denora zinc smog so it it was a really crazy story about how the two of them got together and Mm -hmm. uh yeah this region is is so if you'll pardon my language stupid for this (laughs) it's just it's it, uh, it, it, it 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 is known yeah, it, it is known that that region we see stuff we don't see anywhere else. I mean, the national headquarters of FTD are in the Pennsylvania, and you sort of think, well, now why why is that there? And and it there's there's stuff that happens from breathing in that that smog or just the work that they have to do. I know when I was spraying goats with some chemical when I was ten years old, the whole time I was spraying and the wind was blowing it on me, I thought, I'm gonna die from this later. My parents are trying to kill me right now. I'm gonna make sure. So are you are you I've, familiar with Ray Dorsey? No. Okay. He's written a book on ending Parkinson's and he did he's the reason I know about the paraquat and the TCE and um uh and I just lost my train of thought. What stage is that? Um, <laughs> that's called caregiver stage. <laughs> yeah. That's when what, I was 21, I volunteered, <laughs> I volunteered to live with my grandmother. That was in 1980. And she was forgetting things on the stove and was going to be evicted. So that was my first introduction to any kind of dementia. But that back then we called it senile. You know, mm-hmm. dementia wasn't really a word. You either, had, you either had senility or you had hardening of the arteries. And yeah. senility is Alzheimer's and hardening of the arteries is vascular dementias. And now we know there's like four dozen vascular dementias and there's four domains of Alzheimer's and it's not one little simple thing. Yeah. And so she had dementia and my mother had dementia. So I'm just, hello. Um, yeah, but it, okay. So this is, that's actually a, a wonderful question. Um all I, I cannot tell you, but daily or weekly, somebody says, yes, my grandmother had Alzheimer's and my mother had Alzheimer's. And the reality is, yeah, they probably did. They probably had something vascular because we had no vascular drugs. My family doesn't develop dementia, but an awful lot of us drop dead at 40. Now, my blood pressure is never anything other than regular, but my youngest sister has been on high blood pressure medicine since she was 20. And that's not normal. So she's got the gene and and I don't. And so when you look back at family, I wouldn't look back and think they had Alzheimer's, mama had Alzheimer's, now I'm going to get Alzheimer's as well. I would look back and think how much vascular events were you seeing happen? Was there obesity? Was there a difference in uh, food? Were there little strokes going on? Were there strokes at the end? Was there high blood pressure finally noticed? Did they have a heart attack? Because all of those things say you have a vascular gene in your family and you may or may not have that gene. But it's rare that we see a family that has Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. That's really the early onset group. And that's only about 5% of that group are familial. And that whole group can trace their origin back to a valley region of Germany. So just to make you feel better, (laughs) personally and professionally, I would bet that your family history is more vascular dementia, which can be prevented than it is, oh my gosh, I'm going to get Alzheimer's. And you're doing support groups and husband got sick. Sounds like you're caregiving again. The first thing every caregiver thinks when they can't recall something like that is, oh, crap, I've got it, too. And no, you don't. You just have the stress of caregiving, which is is real. And I was just saying that I wouldn't be surprised if further down the road, um, I would I would be surprised. I I would be surprised We're we're they're actually very, very close to stuff that is actually going to be helpful. And if we can just get people diagnosed soon enough, that'll be even better. But um, I, I. stress the stress of covid 
the stress of the pandemic, the stress of the politics, the stress of what crazy person lives next to me that I didn't know was crazy before, but now I do. The amount of drinking that we've done over the last four years, everything around us in our life has added enough stress that all of us feel like something is wrong. And as caregivers, especially somebody who goes and leads support groups and helps with support groups, you have to make sure that you're taking care of yourself mm -hmm. before you go take care of others. And you have to do your, your preparations for that because otherwise you come home and you don't remember what you went in that room for. And I know that's normal brain function. Linda knows it's normal brain function, but your first thought is I've got it too. And, and you don't. Well, I have a chronic illness, so that's part, and memory brain fog is part of that. So, and I remembered the thing that I was going to say before. All kinds of neurodegenerative diseases seem to be on the rise here. The longer, you know, people who are born in this area. I mean, I've met five people with MS. It's it's kind it's just kind of ridiculous in our area. But and um, Parkinson's, all the support groups. There are twenty seven of them in this region. The attendance numbers are on the rise. And um, the caregiver, the dementia caregiver support group that I attend, it's having trouble getting back into gear since COVID, but the people that do attend, those numbers are on the rise in this area, so. Well, we're seeing the last big push of the baby boomers. I'm in the last year of the baby boomers and we're actually the largest group. And so we have entered into our 60s and 70s, which is where you're going to see more long-term chronic illnesses occur anyway. So part of it is just the population and the age of that population is finally the last group is coming through. And so that that's part of the reason. Part of the reason is they're getting better at spotting stuff earlier. Part of it is people used to go to get diagnosed for MS and they might take quite a while to diagnose, whereas now testing is much, much better. So it's a, it's a variety of things that are happening that, that are out there, but self-compassion.org is critical for everybody you talk to, everybody at your support group and yourself to go take the test and see, am I treating myself right? And then, you know, Glenda and I'll both tell you, our friends in San Antonio, I'll tell you the same thing. Come to Texas. We're a whole other country. <laughs> yep. I oh, took nephew just little... bought his first house there. So I may be down there at some point. <laughs> wait, wait, wow. where is he? Because Glenda and I will show up on his front step and say, your aunt's looking for you and, and just <laughs> crap it. We don't mind doing it. Just ask Guinevere. We can, she'll tell you, we'll come get you. <laughs> we will yeah, they will. You down. <laughs> we will come and look for you. They so will yeah, we're happy, happy to go bother your nephew and say, yeah, your aunt was going to leave you a lot, but she's not now because you moved to Texas. Right. <laughs> but um, we've, we've got land out here where you, you, it's all clear. You, you won't breathe in anything. So um, remember to do your meditation, everybody. Remember the mindful movement on YouTube, free, great meditation, 10-minute uh, meditations, or four-hour nighttime I can't sleep meditations, the mindful movement. I also go to therapy in a nutshell on YouTube, therapy in a nutshell. I told my therapist, Glenda, if I'd found her first, I'd have never called you. She uh does little... 10 to 20 minute nuggets of therapy that actually give you tools to deal with anxiety. Uh, she's got a whole series on anxiety to deal with depression, to deal with the stuff that's going on around you. And she is fabulous. Remember to start doing breathing meditation. We know that that is the healthiest exercise we can give you for your brain. And it's trying to master the art of breathing without thinking about anything except breathing and that's what repairs the brain and it makes the brain very very happy um i have sent uh in the past glenda or minerva should have the texas best practices model that was developed in the state of texas and should be able to send that out to you it'll print out at about 24 pages or so but it is the steps and tests needed to make a definitive dementia diagnosis and it allows you to give your loved one the slums test, the depression test, the anxiety test to stage them before you ever go see the neurologist. You come in going, here's my info. And now when will these tests start? And it 
will make a difference. Remember that not every neurologist is a specialist in dementia. Most neurologists are not. And only a few are dementia specialists and that's who your loved one needs to see. And then if you're near a dementia community or a dementia uh, testing center, that's who you would wanna go to. There are plenty of scans that can be done without using an MRI. And um, don't watch the news. It's depressing as all get out and it'll just drive you down. Oh, I avoid it. And sometimes don't watch football. Um. <laughs> don't go there, Glenda. Every game. Don't go in there. I'm not going there. Uh, we're so glad you joined us today. As you can tell, this is a serious topic. Anything having to do with dementia is a serious topic. So we do interject levity and humor and laughter because it's healing. It, it helps. So don't think we're trying to be disrespectful. We're not. So let's go over here and look and see. We have a few comments. I had asked if you found it helpful for me to enter the resources as we went through the session. And I got an answer that, yes, it was. So I'm glad to hear that. It's the first time I've really tried it as Tam went along through her presentation or her conversation with you. Um, Jane, really? I thought you'd been doing that all along. I have not. I, no, I put them in the follow-up email, but I felt like, okay, okay. listening to what relates to it, let's do it right now. Anyway. That's cool. Oh, yeah. So Jamie says she wants to thank you for calling her back a few weeks ago. Uh, so you do call back because I gave them your phone number. You do. She said that she completed the assessments and palliative care is coming tomorrow. She joined support group and being able to sit down and find out her love's final wishes. Appreciate you again. Very touching. Very touching. Thank you, Janie, for entering that so we can see, you know, the reality of the situation. Karen, <laughs> this is getting funny down here. Karen says she's watched all the webinars and thankful for Guinevere for relating her story. So we learned about cognitive reserve. Wow. See, Guinevere, you got to keep coming back. And then Christine, <laughs> don't Plus, go if you right try not to, we'll come find you. Yeah. yeah. You need to adopt me. <laughs> oh, we do. We have already. Okay. You well, you okay <laughs> we adopted you like two years ago. Exactly. Hey, look, way longer than yeah, that. we did. <laughs> this is a seventh year. <laughs> and then Christine said, some people binge watch Netflix. I binge watch, binge watch Dr. Tam. It's been a lifesaver. Whoa. She's some of that numbers out oh there. Oh my gosh, we got to get you another channel. Yeah. <laughs> Try the therapy in a nutshell, gal. She's pretty helpful. She's good. She's good. Thank you. Those, those are very sweet things. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. It's such a joy to be with you all and, and a pleasure. So next month, I'm not sure what the date will be, but watch for the calendar. We'll be back again, Tam and I will. Um, at some point, maybe at the new year, we'll start... Well, I'm not sure. These have been so wonderful, I think, Tam. I started to say, maybe we'll start an educational session again, going through, let me get it out. I always plug it. She doesn't ask me to. The Itty Bitty Dementia Book, available on Amazon. Um, and at some point, we talk about going through that to uh, do an education program. But this is plenty of education. <laughs> for me so anyway you will receive a follow-up email if you register for today's call and um we've put the resources here so i don't think i'm going to repeat myself going there um but in that follow-up email you're going to have um input for us so tell us how you like the session what you learned from the session if you have topics you feel like that would be good for us to to cover, we'll be happy to do that too. If you've been out and about, maybe at your church, maybe a local area in aging, if you hadn't heard Tam speak, follow, see if you can find her. But anyway, you may have seen him seen the speaker that you thought would be good on the care tele connection. Let us know about that. Just give us all the feedback that that you have for us. So Tam, final words. No. Uh, yes. Well. You know, I'll be in Wichita Falls all day Thursday Good. speaking uh, for the Area Agency on Aging. Go, North Go. Texas Agency on Aging. And Saturday, I'll be speaking in Austin at the Town Square Adult Day Center. And oh. both places are giving away books. So if you're in those areas, you can go get a book. There you go. Good resources. 
Thank you, Tam. We plugged the Area Agency on Aging because I was the director of the Area Agency on Aging here in Austin, Texas for 17 years. They are a good organization and they were, are well hidden. So that should be one yes, of your- Yes, they are the best, least known branch of the government and they they nobody knows them. Nobody That's knows right. them. That's right. It's your tax dollars at work, for sure. It is your tax dollars at work from the Older Americans Act of 1964. My graduate program training was to train me to take over a, a AAA. And I can't be in an office that long, Glenda. I'm a free spirit. I hear the- I hear the yeah. mountains calling. Yeah, her feet, her feet get scratching. She's got to get out on the road. <laughs> All righty. I want to, let's see, we've gone about 15 minutes over, which Tam and I, it doesn't matter to us. That clock just really doesn't matter. So we're glad that you joined us today. Take care of yourself um, and join us next month again with the wonderful Dr. Tam Cummings. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Y'all take care. Bye, Pennsylvania. Bye-bye, Karen. Thanks. Bye, Dr. Cummings. Bye, Ms. Quinn.